requires states to um, create a list of the water quality in each state um, compared to the uses that you want to use that water for. So that swimmable, drinkable, fishable, and aquatic life. Um, and that's called the um, 305B report. And then the 303D, these are named after sections of the Clean Water Act. 303D report lists those waters that are um, that are limited or uh, you know are not meeting water quality standards. And then we put those together, and that's called the integrated group. So we divide up the state into um, five water regions, and each uh, two-year integrated report, we're focusing on one of the regions. So the Rawway um, is grouped with the Raritan uh, water region. We did a intensive assessment of the Raritan region in 2016, and we'll come back to do another intensive um, assessment of the Raritan region in um, 2026. And uh, the whole state is covered every two years. And the, the website that's that's there, um, and we can share the uh, the presentation website is where you can get that report. Go a little more into detail on that. Um, so what for the integrated report, we um, do a data solicitation, it's called. So we um, the way the Clean Water Act specifies that you have to use available information, available data that meets the um, data data quality uh, requirements. So um, so this is, you know, I just want you to know, like the, the state does look for data that is not necessarily um, collected by the state agency, but it can come from other sources. So we have specified due dates for when, when that date, uh, data needs to be collected and when it needs to be submitted into the public databases where we um, download the data from. This is that uh, the website where the where we have our integrated report, and just so uh, you know, another time maybe you'd be interested in going to that website and take a look at the um, state the tab that says statewide assessments, and that's where you would get the integrated report. There's a nice story map, um, or you can go into more detail depending on how much detail you want. And then um, towards the the another tab. Uh, says the Raritan, and that is the one that goes into more detail on the Raritan region. So in um, the bureau that I work in, we kind of, we are in like a constant um, cycle where we're looking at the, um, we're doing all these parts of the cycle, like constantly to do this biennial report. So we, we do outreach, um, we meet with stakeholders, find out what their concerns are about the water quality in that region. Um, and uh, we work with partners, we do our own monitoring, but we also work with partners that do monitoring. Um, and then the assessment uh, step is that creating that integrated report and comparing that information to um, to our standards and then uh, trying to determine what are the causes of the impairment. And then um, to the top left, um, implementation, which is developing restoration plans to implement actions uh, that would be um, impairing, like if the source is non-point solution, we would, non-point pollution, pollution would be to um, create a plan for how to address that. Um, we can also develop um, total maximum daily loads are abbreviated to TMDLs. Uh, that's usually for um, addressing point sources of impairment and um, also developing protection plans that protect healthy watersheds so that they don't get impaired. What type of water quality data is collected? So first, um, physical conditions of the water. So for example, stream depth, uh, flow, and temperature, um, biological conditions, such as the number and type of living creatures and bacteria and the condition of the habitat, chemical characteristics, so for example, concentrations of nutrients and dissolved oxygen. And then the final type um, that I've listed is um, identifying 
and reporting harmful algal blooms. And for what we're doing tonight, we're learning about how to monitor for um, physical and biological conditions. So what is community water monitoring? So a lot of people uh, interchange a lot of different words. Um, and I just, the one that I crossed out was just for fun. It is fun to do community water monitoring, I think, uh, but it's not just for fun. Uh, so here's, here's my definition that we use. Uh, community water monitoring is the collection of scientific data by concerned people working in partnership with professional scientists and government decision makers. So there's two keywords that I'd like to emphasize, scientific and working with uh, decision makers. So you, there's, um, there's a specific goal for, um, for the project that you're working on. And DEP's objectives for community water monitoring are to increase the uh, quantity and quality of data that we're getting from water monitoring. It's great to, um, to get partnerships from the public in the state and to aid in um, characterizing our, um, the waters of the state and then using that data to support science-based decisions. So we awarded, as, as Aaron said, we awarded a grant to the Watershed Institute to manage the w New Jersey Watershed Watch Network. And there's the website, it's just New njwatershedwatch.org. And um, so that's kind of our, our umbrella for coordinating our community water monitoring program. And the benefits to a group of participating in the Watershed Watch Network is we're trying to create it and developing it to be a one-stop shop for New Jersey water, community water monitoring issues and making clearly defined pathways for, um, for learning about and accepting the data and information sharing, frame workshops like we're doing tonight. So we're communicating so between New Jersey DEP and community water monitoring groups and the Watershed Watch Network. So, um, you know, each group, each watershed group, um, like Broadway River Watershed Group, is it's, it's its own group, but you're communicating with the Watershed Watch Network for, um, for some training and advice and, and health issues and, um, and then uh, getting the benefit from that. And then that group um, is the direct uh, communicator with the, you know, if that group has staff and or volunteers. And one of the things that Erin has done with the Watershed Watch Network is just did, an, she did an, in, um, an inventory of who's out there collecting uh, water data for us. And so she found 49 participants, uh, 31 groups throughout the state are actively monitoring for water quality and eight more are maybe interested. They would like to start monitoring programs. So that's great. Uh, we wanna help, help those groups out. Um, and 10 service providers. So service providers are like DEP itself. Um, the EPA sometimes provides say equipment loan and uh, interstate function and sometimes do um, bacterial analysis and things like that. And then in additional um, organizations that might be interested in monitoring. And um, so we'd, we'd be the resource that can, can help them get something started. So what we're trying to accomplish trying to accomplish and how we'll get there. So we want to get high quality data for inclusion in the report and how we can get there is by doing individualized technical assistance to groups like yours. Um, we want to get consistent data between multiple community groups and how we'll get there by standardized quality assurance project plans, which I'll, I'll talk more about and um, facilitating 
review of the of the co-ops, uh, data entry, data visualization, whatever like technical um, assistance that the group needs. Um, and we want to get more comprehensive data throughout the state and we'll get there by doing, um, finding out what people are doing out there and through things like this stream school that we're doing tonight. So the first thing that we need groups to do is to define what their objectives are. So one objective could be um, education and municipal action. Next tier is to do to screen for water quality uh, and then to target further monitoring. So just kind of get a general idea of where water quality is good or not, and then um, target further monitoring based on that information. Uh, another use would be to evaluate restoration success. So say you put in a new uh, green infrastructure, so maybe a, a stormwater basin or a riparian restoration or rain gardens and um, kind of evaluate whether, whether that that restoration benefited water quality. Um, dam removal is another one, uh, you know, and seeing what the, how that affects water quality. And then report cards. So each, each group uh, might want to have a, a website or a newsletter or whatever to, um, to communicate what they've found out about the water quality in the, in the area that, where, they, um, where they care about. And then the, um, the next tier is regulatory. Uh, so that's what we're talking about as being the um, the most stringent requirements to collect data because it's for regulatory purposes. So, for example, the integrator and the MDLs that go maximum data loads. So those that data that's collected for those purposes has to be to the um, the highest quality because it's uh, it could be requiring. Um, you know, significant sums of money to address those problems. And we want that to go where it's, uh, where it's needed, where, where it's gonna benefit water quality. So once we've decided what the uh, goal is of our program, then um, we need to answer a few more questions to design our study. So, um, so we talked about water monitoring to the goal. Uh, then there's a lot of details to nail down about technical design. How are you monitoring? And then um, what are you doing with the information? What are you doing with the data? How are, how are you going to use that data to answer the question and the goal that you have? So I've mentioned the Assurance Project Plan before, and uh, we abbreviate that by saying QOP. So basically a QOP is, um, is a written plan that shows how you, you're documenting all of your data procedures so that anybody um, who wants to use your data and including yourselves, you know that that data is going to meet your project needs. And involved in, in the project is following the same rules and the same procedures and you can be confident in your data. So basically a co-op is taking your study design to the next level. Um, you're, you're adding measures to prevent errors before sampling begins. For example, with um, field audit, with the training and the field audits and the uh, macroinvertebrate tests that you'll be doing that assures that you really understand how to do, collect the data and that everybody's doing it the same way. Um, and another um, quality control measure is to know how to, um, correct errors after sampling has occurred. So uh, for example, you could um, check a certain percentage of the macroinvertebrate samples to uh, with somebody with an, another um, person or lab to confirm that, that, um, that your quality control is, is good. And then you want your um, QAP to be approved and signed. So if you want DP to be using your data, then DEP needs to be the one to sign your QAP. So to, to summarize, a QAP isn't always uh, required. So for that, uh, this kind of builds on that slide I showed um, before, 
So for if the data is going to be used for education and municipal action, that's tier one and a co-op is not required for that. If the data is going to be used for um, water quality, eval evaluating restoration success and report cards, that's tier two. A co-op is required, but it doesn't have to be approved by the Office of Quality Assurance. So it would be approved by DEP, but um, if the data is used for tier three, for regulatory purposes, then you need a co-op. It needs to be um, approved by the Office of Quality Assurance. So again, showing kind of the same format. Um, so tier one, this, you need a, um, a study design with defined methods locations and time frame. That's what we recommend. Um, and a standard operating procedure. So it can be used for those purposes that we said, education and maybe municipal action, but um, you don't have to have a whole, a whole quality assurance project plan for that. If I need to be used for tier two, then um, the quality assurance project plan has to use uh, standard methods and be approved by the data user. So it depends on who's using your data on the exact requirements. So, um, and Aaron and I can assist with that, uh, with that as well, but it does not go to the Office of Quality Assurance. Now for tier three, which is what we're working on tonight, the requirements are that the co-op has to be approved by New Jersey DEP, EPA, or USGS. Now, EPA and USGS usually only um, approve co-ops for projects that they're funding or that they're involved in. So for a group like yours, that you would go through through us, through DEP. Um, and the, method, the, the methods that are accepted for um, the macroinvertebrates are what we're going to be learning uh, through this stream school. And if your project wanted to include field parameters, for example, dissolved oxygen or uh, pH, those, those um, parameters that you measure while you're in the stream, uh, that does require a certification from the Office of Quality Assurance. And also if your project wanted to collect um, chemical, like chemical sam samples that would be analyzed in a lab for chemical parameters like nutrients, or um, pathogens it would also have to be um, a laboratory that has a certification for, but that's from Office of Quality Assurance. So again, but what we're working on tonight is just doing a co-op that's approved by, by DEP using the macroinvertebrate method. So this just goes into a little more detail of the study design, the things that uh, that your um, design has to go through. Um, you know, what are your research questions? Your um, monitoring sites? Who's going to do the monitoring? Your uh, time frame, your frequency, and um, how you're going to collect your how you're going to um, store your data and enter that into, you know, what sort of a database and um, how you're going to communicate and use that data afterwards. So this kind of just lays out the uh, path from community water monitoring groups to, um, to get their data to New Jersey DEP. So you start out with your problem identification or your question. You design your study and you write your co-op with, you know, you can get assistance from Aaron and I and um, get that co-op approved. Then you go guys out at your, uh, do your field work and your data collection. And then that data needs to go into a um, national database. And that would be, uh, or, or another database um, what, that suits your needs. And that would be for tier two. 
if you want to go to tier three, uh, which is what we're training for tonight, once that data is in that specific database called the waterqualitydata.us, then um, the data uh, gets gets pulled or downloaded by DEP. Bears is the is the abbreviation for the bureau where I work, um, and um, gets downloaded and used for the um, for the integrated report. So for that uh, stream health assessment, like we talked about. So this is just an example of that data management. This is sometimes very challenging, but it's really important to go through all this effort um, tonight and for the next you know, week, um, really learning a lot and putting a lot of effort into learning how to collect your data so that it's, um, so that it's very reliable and good data. And then you need to have a plan for what you're gonna do with the data after you get it, you're probably going to use, um, you know, paper uh, forms. Um, then, how does it get from the paper to the computer? Uh, quality assurance checks, and um, then get from the computer to the national database, and um, and maybe you know some some ways that you're going to share within your group and within your community to share the data that you're that you're collecting. So I just want to share just just a couple just information about a couple other uh, types of community water monitoring projects in the Navasink River. Um, for a couple of years, they've been doing um, a pathogen track down, um, trying to restore shellfish harvest that was um, you know the shellfish area had too much bacteria, and using an approach that we call find it and fix it. So rather than having uh, the DEP's uh, like compliant, compliance and enforcement come in and, and uh, levy fines, just finding the problems and fixing them. It's much easier than having lawsuits about fines and so forth. Um, so if, you, if everybody's cooperating and everybody has the same goal, we certainly hope that they do, the same goal of having healthy waters, a healthy world for, uh, for us to enjoy, and um, and what's the best way for us to get there? Uh, there's a project in Barnegat Bay that use, com uses community water monitoring uh, volunteers and professionals to um, collect samples. And we have another project in uh, to monitor for harmful algal blooms in, um, in lakes. So that's that's an issue that not just in New Jersey, but it's an issue. There's been uh, a lot of uh, uh, much increases in harmful algal blooms, and um, so we did a uh, webinar in the summer about that. How um, how people can participate in that if they're interested. And then this winter we also did a um, a project to measure the impacts of road salt on our surface waters using trips that use volunteers. And then um, just for the future, you know, we're, we're going to be around training, providing workshops, developing more resources for community water monitoring groups. We have, um, we've been having an annual roundtable where um, community water monitoring groups can network, network with each other, um, have speakers from New Jersey TEP, address the different um, issues that we have, like, you know, getting volunteers and keeping everybody trained and uh, what to do with the data, things like that. So that's the end of my presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, Debbie. And now, Clea, you are up. Hello. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, general stuff. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself and my organization and talk a little bit about our, our program. 
um, and how it fits into what Debbie was talking about. So um, my name is Clea Carchia and I'm executive director of the Rawway River Watershed Association. Um, I've been working with them for, for a little over six years and um, the only staff person. So we have a nine member board and uh, um, so, okay. So the RRWA, we're a uh, 501c3 celebrating our 30th year this year. So it's actually our 30th anniversary. Um, and um, in addition to the water quality monitoring, our organization um, does a lot of different types of um, programming to watershed re residents um, of all ages, including environmental education presentations, um, rec recreational events, uh, along the river, um, including hikes and our yearly canoe and kayak race. We have um, a lot of like eco uh, ecology walks, like bird walks and things like that. Um, we, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities like cleanups and working on native plant gardens. In addition to the water quality monitoring, other types of citizen science programs as well. So um, new in 2020 is um, the, the uh, RRWA started a river friendly certification program for schools and residents. Um, so we, we just um, signed on as, as, a, as an affiliate to a program that was already being done by the Watershed Institute. And uh, what it, um, it, it, ju it just certifies residences and schools. And it's really simple. You just go on to the um, the the river friendly New Jersey river friendly website and you sign you take this um, it's like a, a survey of, of a bunch of questions and you get certified and then you would get a sign like this which just came in the mail today <laughs> our custom made river friendly sign um, so you could put that in your yard to show you that you're river friendly so that's another program that we're doing so I just wanted to tell you some of the other things that we're doing besides the water quality monitoring, um, you know, in case you might want to get involved with some, something else as well. So um, in addition, um, we are having this year our first annual um, Rawway River Fest. It's going to be a week long festival celebrating the river. Um, and that will be in, in the town of Rawway. And it, the purpose is to bring attention to the, envir to the environment and environmental issues and to look to change people's attitudes and opinions about the river. Um, so the Rawway River watershed is, um, is one of the oldest urbanized areas of the state of New Jersey, stretching from Edison um, to in Middlesex County through Union County, north to the oranges of Essex County and west to Wachung reservations. It covers 24 towns uh, and about 130 square miles. So the main branches and tributaries of the Rawway River are the east and west branches, the Nomahegan Brook, the Robinson's Branch, the South Branch, and then they all come together and form the main branch, which goes out to the Arthur Kill. So as far as our program goes, our water quality monitoring program, we started back in 2018. And um, this program is, our program is funded in part by the Watershed Institute. And um, the training sessions, as Debbie said, are provided by um, the New Jersey DEP uh, in partnership with the Watershed Institute. So um, this year we have expanded the program from visual assessments um, or habitat assessments as they're uh, known, known as to um, include the macro invertebrate uh, identification. So the goal of this program is to train all of you guys <laughs> um, to um, you know, join our stream team and to become proficient enough so that you can go out on your own to perform regular monitoring of the river. Um, so 
probably like twice a year. The first step will be to find um, a monitoring. This is this, you know, you're going to find, you're going to learn all about exactly how to do the monitoring from those guys. But for me, you know, we're going to figure out like where, um, you know, where, where you can go and adopt a location and how often you go out and, and schedule with me, pick up the kits and go out and get the monitoring done, bring the data back to me. So that'll kind of like be something that we're gonna have to work out together one-on-one -on -one, um, after this whole session is over. So that's about it. <laughs> so back to you, Erin. All right, thank you, Clea. Sure. So let's see, there we go. Um, I just wanted to, I, I think that's a really great jumping off point to something that I missed from uh, reviewing the agenda at the top of this webinar. Um, because we are using this data for DEP, um, this could be used in, for regulatory action. We need to make sure that our volunteers know what they're doing. <laughs> so on April 17th, we have a separate day to do field audits and macroinvertebrate ID testing. So um, this Sunday, April 11th, we'll go over how to do the collection and introduction into um, the identification procedures. Then the following weekend, we'll come back out and a field audit is kind of like, and not so much a test, but it's something you know where you guys are gonna go through the motions of conducting a full assessment, doing the habitat assessment and doing uh, the macroinvertebrate collection and ID. And so Debbie and I will be there to kind of watch, answer any questions you have, and just generally make sure that you've got it down and that you feel comfortable to then go out and do this work on your own. That day will also include a macro ID test. And what that is, uh, is 50 preserved specimens. Uh, you'll go through them so you can spend as much time as you wish. It generally takes about an hour, hour and a half to go through all 50 bugs. Um, but you just go through, fill out your test sheet and we, you know, we all are going to pass because we're all feeling confident and we're going to retain all this information. Um, and it's an open book test. It's, you know, you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. What I'm trying to teach you how to do when we go over macroinvertebrate identification is to be able to use dichotomous keys and to be able to use the guides in the field. Um, so it's not necessarily memorization. It's more just learning how to use a tool and then putting it to use during the test. Um, so uh, again, I will send out um, the survey just to, to see who is interested in attending both that uh, in-person event and uh, the testing the following weekend. So water quality monitoring in general, Debbie mentioned this, it, it can be broken out into a few different categories. We usually say that there are physical monitoring activities, biological monitoring, and chemical monitoring. So when you do a chemical monitoring um, activity, you, you might go out, you have a handheld meter, you stick your probe in the water um, or for temperature or something like that, and it just shoots back a value at you. And this is like an instantaneous reading of how that water quality is looking in that moment. And so something like temperature or dissolved oxygen, it's going to change all day, every day. It's constantly on the move. Um, and on the other side of that equation, we can look at the physical conditions or the habitat conditions in our stream and around our streams. What really kind of brings these two things together is biological monitoring. Um, so it's, you know, while chemical monitoring is sort of like a snapshot, the, the physical condition of the stream provides the infrastructure 
um, we want to see if we have good water quality and good habitat to support a really healthy and diverse biological community. There are a number of different organisms that we might use for biological monitoring. We could use fish, amphibians, shellfish of different types. But for our purposes, we are going to focus on benthic macroinvertebrates. So, you know, if you haven't heard that word before, it's all good. We're, we're going to go break it down and go over each part of part of this term. So benthic refers to bottom dwelling organisms. They live on the bottom and near the bottom of the stream. Freshwater means that they're found in freshwater streams, lakes, and rivers. Um, our focus will be on the Rahway River um, upstream of any sort of tidal influence. Uh, macro means that the organisms are large enough to be seen with the human eye. And um, we'll, we'll see some really big blown up pictures of these specimens, but I've also tried to include pictures of the bugs on hands. So you can kind of see a relative scale of these organisms. Sometimes after we go through these presentations and we look at these, these bugs all blown up with all of their parts all beautifully displayed, then we get out into the stream and, and people are like, that's it? You know, it's a <laughs> size of a fingernail or smaller. Um, so we, it is large enough for us to see, but we may need, need magnification to look at some of the finer details of these guys. And invertebrate means that these are organisms without a backbone. So if we have, um, you know, fish or salamanders uh, end up in our sample, we're going to go ahead and toss those back. Now, macroinvertebrates are really great to use because um, they live in the stream for a, quite a long time. It does differ depending on the species. Um, but they can live in the stream for anywhere from, you know, a few months to a few years. So, you know, for example, if there is a big pollutant event, we have a whole lot of phosphorus entering the stream at one time. If we're doing chemical monitoring, we have to, to get to that stream at the right exact moment to capture that spike in, in that chemical concentration. But when we look at macroinvertebrates, they're in one place and they live there for a long time. So while we might not, might not catch that phosphorus spike, we will potentially see changes in the macroinvertebrate community that could indicate that there's some sort of um, water quality issue in this stream. Um, the, the critters are also pretty easy to collect. As you'll see, all you really need is a net and a bucket and you know, a good key to figure out what the organisms are. And what's really great about these organisms is that each of these taxa that we'll go over, they are assigned a value from zero to 10. And this is their pollution tolerance value. Uh, so a lower pollution tolerance value, something like zero, would mean that it can barely withstand any sort of pollution. On the other side of that scale, a pollution tolerance value of 10 or so, would indicate that it can withstand a ton of pollution. So here are some examples of different organisms that we might find in the different categories. So we have um, in our pollution sensitive category, stonefly nymphs and mayfly nymphs. Um, you may or may not be familiar with these guys in their terrestrial form, um, but kind of about this time of year, mayflies are starting to hatch in, from their, their nymphal stage into their adult stage. And so in their, in their nymphal or larval stage, we could call it underwater, that's the section, that's the part of their life cycle that we're going to focus on. But when they come up out of the stream, if you're lucky, you might, we might be able to catch it. The mayflies emerge in such huge numbers for such a short amount of time. They're called mayflies because they come up, they're hugely abundant. It's like smoke, you're having to like wipe them out of your face and then they're gone in an instant. Because in their larval phase, 
they eat and they grow and they eat and they grow. When they come out of that phase, they go into adulthood and their only goal is to mate and then die. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting life cycle um, where we're capturing that at a very specific time. In our pollution neutral category, this is kind of the organisms that can withstand some uh, you know, pollution, um, but they might die off if there's a huge influx. These are things like damselfly nymphs or crayfish. Uh, the damselfly is very closely related to the dragonfly as well. So the dragonfly, that's, that tends to be a, you know, an adult, a fly that we're all kind of familiar with. We see them buzzing around streams and ponds. They actually spend the first part of their life underwater in their larval phase um, as a macroinvertebrate. And then they come to the side and emerge as adults. Um, so these are kind of our middle group. We definitely want to see them in our streams. And on the other end of the spectrum, the, the eights, nines, and tens of our pollution tolerance value scale are organisms that can withstand pretty much anything you throw at them. So something like a scud or a leech, it's, you can kind of even hear it in the names, right? A scud, eh, they, they can handle anything. A worm, a leech. Um, there are instances where we will go out as staff and preserve our specimens in 95% ethanol. And that's, you know, there's so many ways to collect these macroinvertebrates and assess them. Um, when we do it, we preserve them in the field and bring them back to the lab. Um, there was a case where we, I, I had preserved a whole sample in 95% ethanol, you know, left it on a shelf, came back two days later to sort through it and identify the bugs. And there were worms in there that were still alive. So if they can withstand 95% ethanol, I'm pretty sure they can handle you know, a little bit of phosphorus pollution uh, potentially in that stream. Uh, you know, but that's a really extreme example of, of these bugs and their pollution tolerance values. Ultimately, what we want to see, you know, scuds and leeches, they're not bad. They're just more tolerant. We want to see a diversity of all of these different types of organisms, sensitive, neutral, and tolerant. That's going to indicate a really healthy condition. Um, so in New Jersey, we look at these specific, I think 21, 22 different taxa. Um, this is a look at the, at the paper data sheet that we fill out while we're in the field. So um, as you're going through, you're kind of sorting through your sample, you pull out individuals, you look at it, compare it to a key, and you would tally them on this data sheet. And that's how we would collect our data in the field. Now, um, for some of the organisms, we see a complete insect life cycle. Um, and this looks like, so for the black fly, this is an example. We have eggs that turn into larva underwater. Those go into the pupa phase um, where they basically you know, become mush and emerge as an adult. And so the larva tends to not really have um, a lot of physical characteristics that are similar to the adult phase. Um, so you can see here, we are focusing underwater on the larval phase. So for those organisms with the complete life cycle, we're not, um, if we do happen to pull a pupa out or eggs, um, we can go ahead and put that right back in the water. We're focusing just on these larval um, organisms. And you can see that there is some size variability within that larval uh, stage of the life cycle. So just as, they, as they, they've just hatched from the egg stage, they're going to be pretty small. And then they, can, they tend to grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so the eggs will be laid sort of around this time as the adults come up, you know, they get busy, they lay eggs right away and anywhere from a few seconds to a, about a month later, those eggs will hatch into larva. So it's kind of this time of year and over the next month, two months where the organisms can be kind of small. 
Um, so we'll, we'll definitely bring some magnification out with us. Um, now in the fall or in the really, really early spring, um, we may find organisms that are kind of in this larger larval phase because they've grown throughout the year and they're about to hatch as adults. So we, we can kind of see um, this, this variability in size. Now we're also looking at organisms that have an incomplete life cycle. Um, so this is a look at the mayfly life cycle specifically. And for incomplete insect life cycles, we basically take out the pupal phase. Um, so the adults will lay their eggs into the water. They will hatch into nymphs or larvae. Um, basically, nymph is the word we use for larva of an incomplete life cycle. So you'll kind of hear me use those words sort of interchangeably, nymph and larva. Um, but nymphs, they grow, they grow, they grow, they come out and they hatch and they become adults. And so the adults um, actually look a lot more similar to uh, the nymphal or larval stage um, than those with a complete life cycle. Um, so this is a look here. This is a mayfly who has crawled to the side of a stream and is emerging, um, basically, you know, kind of coming out of their exoskeleton and shaking off their wings and they're ready for adulthood. And so it really doesn't take a whole lot of effort relatively, you know, for this organism um, to become an adult. And so it looks very similar to its adult phase. What I think is super fascinating about the mayflies um, specifically is uh, how quickly these nymphs will hatch from their egg form. So this image on the right, this is an adult mayfly laying eggs into a, a, a body of water um, and who, you know, this is a really great shot because you can see that she's still laying the eggs actively but the eggs are hatching so quickly that you're already starting to see the nymphs kind of swim around in that little egg sac down below. And this is a great adaptation for an organism laying an egg in a, in a stream, in a, in a moving system where there's tons of predators around. Um, it's much easier to avoid anyone who wants to eat you if you can move rather than um, in your egg form. Uh, we're also looking at uh, benthic macroinvertebrates that are not insects. So these may include things like worms and leeches, snails and clams, or a wide variety of different crustaceans. So up top on the left side, we have a leech. On the right, we have a snail. And on the bottom left, we have a scud kind of a, a ton of scuds in someone's hand. And on the right-hand side, we have a sow bug or an isopod. Um, so this is the kind of the aquatic version of the roly-poly that we might see in our gardens. Now we've looked at our fantastic beasts. Now we're gonna figure out where to find them. Uh, so the first thing that we're, we'll look at, at here is our stream morphology. And Streams can kind of be divided into three different morphologies or, or kind of physical types. Um, we have sections of stream that flow really quickly or, and are much more shallow and they flow over rocks where oxygen is allowed to, to kind of interact the air water interface. Um, the oxygen goes into the water, oxygen is it for all the organisms that live there. Um, this is the riffle area. The water is kind of moving pretty fast. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have pools um, where the water flow is much slower. The temperature can be a little bit warmer, um, whereas the riffles will have cobble and rocks on the bottom. The pools may have more sediment, more sand or clay on the bottom. And we've got organisms, uh, some that prefer riffle habitats, some that prefer pool habitats. Um, we also have this kind of morphology in between the pool and the riffle, and that's what we call a run. Um, and that's where the water is moving, but not necessarily flowing 
over rocks under a riffle condition. So here in this image, we can see the different, uh, the three different morphologies sort of in action. So just take a look at the movement of this water from the foreground moving away from us. And let's just kind of look physically where that water is going. So up front, we can see that the flow is sort of coming across and hitting this bank. And it's moving, it's moving at a pretty good pace, but there's no sort of rocks that it's flowing over. This is an area that we might call a run. Now, when the center flow hits that bank, it's gonna kind of take a right turn and head over this rock face, which creates a pool little habitat on the right bank, on the right-hand side of this image. And then in the far distance, we can kind of see that there's a, a little bit of a blockade at the end of the pool over which um, there are, there's more cobble and rocks lining the bottom of the stream. And this is the section that we would call a riffle. Now, another thing to consider when we're going out to look at these different habitats is, you know, we're definitely looking for cobble and riffle. So that's gonna have a lot of diversity because that water is really oxygenated. Organisms love oxygen. Um, but we're also looking for um, vegetation underwater or vegetation on the riparian bank that's sort of overhanging into the stream. Uh, so you can see on the right hand side, we have a damselfly larva who's just hanging on to that vegetation. And that is what these organisms do. A lot of them are adapted um, to, to try to be able to stay in one place. So they're clingers or crawlers. They, they kind of just want to stick in one spot. So anything that they can grab onto really, um, where they can find some shelter and then also find some food that's where we're gonna find these macroinvertebrates. In the center images here, we have snags, which is basically like we could have logs or submerged woody debris, basically a grouping of twigs that's fallen into the water and allowed to sort of decay. And as that wood decays, you can see that in this image, we get all these nooks and crannies in that wood where tiny organisms can kind of crawl into this wood and find um, a nice little home away from potential predators. Now leaf packs are another great place to look. Um, leaf packs also provide shelter, um, but they're a really great food source for the organisms that like to munch on this coarse particulate organic matter. Now let's take a closer look um, on the left-hand side, this is what a riffle might look like. There's a, um, a variety of different types. Um, there can be larger boulders, there can be smaller rocks, um, but anywhere where the water is moving and there's rocks that are about the size of a golf ball to the size of a watermelon, that's cobble. And that's what we're looking for when we're looking for cobble and riffle habitat. Um, on the right side, we can see caddisfly larvae. Um, they also have a really interesting adaptation where they will create, they kind of secrete this underwater glue um, and they can grab tiny like bits of gravel and sand or twigs or leaves and they can create this sort of case, this home that they can build around their body. And um, they have a little hole at the top for their head so they can kind of walk around, stick their top legs out and walk around and get, and get food. Um, but you can see, um, or maybe it's difficult to see, but um, these, these kind of little cases that are adhering to this larger rock, um, these are actually organisms. And so when we go through and sample, we wanna make sure that we're rubbing those rocks and getting those organisms off the rock and into our net. Uh, the next type, this is logs and woody debris in action. On the left hand side, we have a log, the bottom of which is submerged in that water. 
And for something like this, we would want to take our net and sort of rub or scrub on the bottom of this log. We can use our hands to kind of rub it a little bit, massage it, get those organisms off the log. And on the right hand side, we have some live twigs from um, trees that are still living, riparian, you know, terrestrial trees. But these branches are hanging into the water. And that definitely still counts. That's just because it's not aquatic vegetation, um, it, that's not necessarily a limitation for these organisms to find shelter. Aquatic vegetation is another uh, great place for us to focus to find bugs. Um, we could have um, vegetation that is em emergent, meaning it comes out of the water. But for those, we'd want to you know, focus on sampling the section underwater because we're looking for um, freshwater organisms. Um, or we could have uh, even terrestrial vegetation again, kind of hanging into the stream. And in that case, we want to kind of take the branches and massage them into the net to get any clinging organisms off. Undercut banks. This is a really interesting one um, because when you first look at this bank, you might say, wow, that's pretty eroded. These conditions, they don't, they don't look great. Um, when actually the root systems of these trees along the bank do a really great job at holding that bank together. And the parts of this, um, this root system that's submerged in the water, that just makes for great habitat for fish, for macroinvertebrates, really any aquatic organisms, they can kind of find a nice little nook in, in those undercut banks. Um, so definitely um, sticking the net kind of in between these little branches and kind of zhuzhing it around to get bugs, that's gonna be um, a very productive place for us to find macroinvertebrates. Now, another way to think about where to find these organisms is to think about them in terms of what they eat. Um, so we'll go through just like the four or five major um, eating groups that we find our macroinvertebrates in. Um, the first we call a scraper. And so this, you can kind of think of them like a cow just kind of walking through a field and munching on grass and going pretty slow. Um, it's the same thing for this water penny beetle larva, called a water penny because it kind of looks like a penny, right? It's copper, it's round. And it has this adaptation where it has this enlarged exoskeleton, which will protect the soft tissue, the organism underneath. But under that shell, We've got an organism with a little mouth, with legs, with gills, and he's just walking along this rock, kind of munching up the algae or any biofilm that's on these rocks. So you'll find a lot of these scrapers in um, riffle and cobble habitats. The shredder, these are organisms that have mouth parts that are adapted for taking larger bits of organic material, things like leaves, and breaking them down into smaller bits, what we call fine particulate organic matter. So here we have a stonefly nymph, and you can see he's kind of making headway on this leaf and just munching. And um, you can find a lot of these clearly in leaf pack areas where there's a tons of leaves in the stream. Now, after the shredders uh, shred that, that coarse particulate matter and make it fine, then we have our collectors come up. Um, so the shredders kind of create the food source almost for our collectors. At the top here, this is a black fly larva. This is a collector filterer. So the black fly larva, it's kind of shaped like a bowling pin. It has a wider um, end of the abdomen and almost like a sticky little butt that it kind of attaches to the bottom of the stream. And you can see in this image, we kind of have you know it, about 10 of these organisms and they have these really cool mouth parts. Um, so we have a zoomed in, in, in image of the mouth parts here. They're sort of fan-like. 
And what they'll do is they'll stick their butt in the bottom of the stream. And as a collector filterer, we'll just kind of, you know, move their, their fan mouth parts through the water column and they'll, they'll just filter out any fine particulate matter that flows their way. And these can be super abundant, um, especially uh, this time of year. So we may see a ton of these on Sunday. Uh, we also have a feeding group called collector gatherers. Now this is a, a different type of, uh, a different way to collect fine particulate organic matter. In this case, we are looking at a net spinning caddisfly larva. Um, so you can maybe see the top of his head in this little net that he's built for himself. Now, all caddisflies have this same adaptation, underwater glue, creating these nets. Some create a case, a hard case that they will build around their body. A net spinning caddisfly, rather than build that case, they build a net, a wider net, so that uh, fine particulates can flow into this net. And they're just hanging back in their net, just waiting for the food to come to them. Predators are another type of organism um, that feed on other organisms, clearly. So um, these you will usually find uh, in the water column. They're free swimming. They can kind of go from riffle areas to leaf packs and kind of feed on all of these other types of uh, macroinvertebrates or potentially uh, small fish as well. Um, so here in this image, we're looking at a dragonfly larva and dragonflies and damselflies have this lower lip that extends out so that they kind of can kind of fold it under their head and they're just walking around on the benthic substrate. And if they see um, that, that might be a mayfly larva, if they see some sort of snack, they can extend out their lower lip, their labium, and grab that food and bring it back. And so um, this is a really cool adaptation that they have, but it also makes for a really great thing for us to look at when we're looking to identify these organisms. So it's only the dragonflies and the damselflies that have this lower lip. If we see that, we can make a pretty easy uh, identification of those organisms. So another way we can look at organisms and where to find them is by how they move and where, where you might find them. So we're kind of looking at this from the top to bottom, from the, from the top of the stream sort of to the bottom to the sediment. So at the top, we'll have clingers who adhere to rocks, things like that water penny beetle, just gonna hang on rocks. They're eating food and walking around. Crawlers are another type of organism that love to hang out in cobble and riffles. And they tend to have these really big um, front set of legs that make it really easy for them to just kind of walk around on these rocks. So hopefully we'll see some mayfly larva with some really buff arms on Sunday. Uh, climbers are those types that prefer um, slower areas, more pools, where there's more vegetation in the water because they love to hang on to that vegetation. And so, um, you know, we're kind of in this middle section of the stream. We have free swimmers. Those tend to be our predators. They're just floating free in the water column. And then on the actual benthic substrate on the bottom of our stream, we have sprawlers. So you might, you know, maybe as a kid, you went hunting for crayfish you, they're definitely sprawling on the bottom of the stream. You could find them in, maybe in, in slower parts of the stream um, and they're just kind of hanging out on the bottom. Now burrowers take it a step further and they dig down into the sediment. So for things like um, clams, they will kind of nestle themselves into the sediment to hide from predators. Or there's types of mayfly larva that have tusks at the top of their head that help them to kind of like burrow their way down into uh, the fine sediment. So there are tons of different places in a stream 
that we could look to find different types of macroinvertebrates. And so I just wanna propose these two pictures to you all. Um, take a look at these streams. Take a look at the diversity of the habitat. Which stream do you think has more macroinvertebrate diversity? And it's not a trick question. Uh, I would say that the stream, you know, barring any huge water quality issues, the habitat of the stream on the right-hand side has much more diversity. It has pools up front, it goes into riffles, and we have some vegetation, we have rocks, we have all of these different things in this stream system. On the left-hand side, we have a lot more sand. The bottom is more uniform, so we don't see those sort of like dips and pools and riffles in the bottom of this stream. Um, and what we also see really is a lot of erosion along this left bank. And so where there's erosion on the bank, there's sedimentation in the stream. Um, so that sediment's got to go somewhere. If it's scoured off the side of the bank, it may end up at the bottom of that stream. So this could be a high gradient stream that you know, is naturally has a lot of rocks and cobbles and riffles, but it could be sort of smothered or embedded in all of this fine sediment. So we love diversity, macroinvertebrates love diversity. And um, when we go out to sample, we are going to sample these diverse habitats. Okay, now we'll talk about where to sample as it, as it relates to your data sheet. We are going to collect, I'll say between 10 and 20 little subsamples with our net. And we're gonna divide up our 10 to 20 subsamples depending on the types of habitat that are most prevalent and most productive. So remember, we love riffles and cobble. We love vegetation. We love woody debris. Those are gonna be the areas that we really wanna focus on. So on your data sheet, it will ask you about the types of macroinvertebrate habitat that you see in the stream. And so you can kind of check these things off on your data sheet as you see them, and then make sure that you, um, you know, split up your 20 samples between these different types, these different areas. So the diversity is the highest in riffles generally, and um, becomes lower as you work down this pyramid. So we find the most bugs in riffles. We find a lot of bugs in woody debris, vegetation, and undercut banks. And sediment is really where we want to spend the least amount of our time. Um, we're not going to find a whole lot of different types of bugs in actually in the sediment. Um, so these top three categories are really uh, what we'll focus on. Now, of course, we'll, we'll go over all of the details of sampling um, in the field on Sunday, but sometimes it's helpful to look at it um, visually in, in this way, and then we'll actually do the work on Sunday. So um, we work with nets, they're called D-nets, and they're called D-nets because they have a flat bottom and kind of a rounded top. Now the bottom of that D, you're going to place level with the stream bottom. And so um, there's gonna be rocks potentially in front of your net that you are going to pick up and scrub. So all of those clingers and crawlers on that rock, we wanna pick up these rocks and underwater in the flow of the stream, we want to rub those rocks quite gently. You know, we don't wanna smush all these critters. We want them to flow into the net. So we're picking up these rocks, we're scrubbing them, and we're setting these rocks aside. And what we're looking for is a clear um, one foot by one foot area in front of this net for us to do the next part of our sampling, which is to kick. Um, so, you, you know, we sometimes call um, our different subsamples things like kicks or jabs. Um, this would be a kick. So we've cleared our area of rocks. Now we kick down into the substrate for 45 seconds to a minute, um, just so we get about 
maybe six inches, nah, that seems like a lot, maybe three inches below the surface. And what we're doing here is not kicking the sediment directly into the net. We're kicking down so that we're dislodging any organisms that are hanging on the bottoms of these rocks or burrowed into this uh, benthic substrate. We wanna kind of clear the path and clear the way for them to come up and float freely into the net. Um, so we're, you know, we try not to get a whole lot of debris into the net. It makes it a little bit harder to sort through and find organism uh, at, at the next part of, of this step. Um, now there's different sampling methods for the different types of habitat that we'll find in a stream. So for riffles, we're gonna rub the rocks and do a kick. For vegetation or woody debris, what we'll do is a jab or massage and sweep. So we can take the net and sort of jab it into the side of the bank. Um, so anything that's climbing on these on this vegetation can be kind of you know pulled off and will go into the net. So after we jab or after we sort of massage the vegetation or massage um, the woody debris into our net, we want to do a sweep, which means we take the net and sort of sweep it through the water column. So anything that we've dislodged from this vegetation or woody debris, we want to capture in our net. And of course, this will make much more sense when we're actually doing this in person. <laughs> um, now, after we've done our 10 to 20 kicks or jabs, then we will come streamside and begin our subsampling and identification process. Um, we are ultimately looking to identify 100 different organisms. So with 10 to 20 kicks or jabs, depending on the stream, depending on the productivity of the stream, you may have collected thousands of organisms in, in your sample. And it would take a really long time to identify all of those different organisms. So we subsample. What that means is we put everything into our bucket, we take a tray, we kind of swirl it around, get the contents of that bucket and the stream water really swirling around in there, and then we will dip it and fill that tray with a sample. And in this middle image here, we have that tray, we have our subsample. We'll then pick through the rocks and the twigs and the substrate and pull out the organisms. And we divide them with a very scientific technique called an ice cube tray. <laughs> so we take them and we can put them into these um, different wells um, with organisms that look similar. Um, so, you know, mayflies with mayflies, blackflies with blackflies. As we're going, we'll use some identification keys and guides to help us, um, you know, work through our, our identifications. We could have, you know, someone be the picker, someone be the identifier, and someone be the recorder you know, however you kind of want to um, divide it up. And once you hit 100 bugs, you are good to go. Um, now 100, it may sound like a lot. It may sound like a, that's a pretty big sample, a lot to work through. Um, and I, I would say that a full assessment, once you have it down, will take maybe an hour and a half to two hours total. Um, so it will take longer, of course, when you are, are new at this and when you're kind of learning who all of these bugs are, um, but will you know, over time, you'll, you'll get more comfortable and uh, it will be a breeze, I think. So again, this is the data sheet. After you've ID'd your bugs, you tally them and count them up on this sheet. Um, you can see in the bottom right hand side of this data sheet, check here if sample count does not equal 100 macroinvertebrates. So we are aiming for 100 bugs. That's, that's really our goal. But in a really polluted stream, um, we may not find 100 different organisms. We may, we may not find enough to do this actual assessment. Now that's data in itself, um, but not the type of data that, that we're looking to assess here. So if you're not able to get 100 bugs, it is what it is. And you do your habitat assessment. And then we probably do a lot of chemical testing to see what is wrong with that stream. Now the next step, this is the last step, um, is equipment decontamination. 
And this is not related to COVID. This is related to invasive species. Um, we have things like the New Zealand, New Zealand mud snail. Um, so you can see kind of how small they are in this image, in this person's hand. Um, I just did a field audit uh, with the Musconet Kong Watershed Association on Saturday. And the Musconet Kong River is the only river that has New Zealand mud snails at this point in time. And so it's really important that anyone going into the Musconet Kong River, when they come out, you gotta scrub, 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 clean your equipment really well because we wanna keep the New Zealand mud snails in the Musconet Kong River. We don't want them to spread all over New Jersey. Uh, there's also um, plants we might find, aquatic plants that can be really invasive. Um, this bottom picture here, this is hydrilla. Um, and this, it, you know, even just one cell, one tiny bit of this plant, if it, if it moves from um, where it exists now in the Delaware and Raritan Canal, if that's transferred somewhere else, it could grow really rapidly and really expand uh, super quickly. So the steps that we will go through during equipment decontamination to prevent the spread of these invasive species is to check, clean, and dry. The first step, we check our equipment for anything that's big, you know, any kind of big pieces of vegetation or any obvious uh, snails or organisms that are hanging on to our boots. We wanna check it and pull those off. Then we will clean our equipment and we'll go through this procedure in person. Um, but basically we will have a bucket of, of stream water. It seems silly to decontaminate with the actual water that you're trying to decontaminate from, but we add a, a, a lab detergent called Alkanox into the bucket. And that bucket, the water becomes really, really soapy. And as we scrub our nets, our boots, our trays, anything that has come in contact with the water, um, that soap will kind of break the cell walls of these things that we don't want. And we'll hopefully leave them at the site where we, where we found them. So you kind of have to approach every stream thinking that there are invasive species in this stream and thinking that the next stream you go into does not have any invasive species. So even if there's no confirmed cases of New, Ze New Zealand mud snail or Didymo in the stream you're, you're monitoring, that doesn't mean they're not there. So we're always gonna decontaminate our gear at the conclusion of our uh, monitoring activities. Now I'm gonna give you guys some homework <laughs> because identification, this is fun homework, it's okay. Uh, our identification, I think it takes some time to learn and get down and, and really become accustomed and used to all of these different taxa. So I would like to invite you to go to macroinvertebrates.org. Uh, it's an easy website to remember if you can spell macroinvertebrates. And this is great because it focuses on the most common species of the Eastern seaboard of the United States. That's where we are, excellent. Everything that we'll find in our stream for the most part, um, will be on this website. And if you're like me and you love to take, you know, BuzzFeed quizzes or whatever, there are also little fun quizzes you can take on this website to sort of test your knowledge and get to know these bugs in a different way. Um, so definitely check this website out, but we will go over um, more of uh, the different things that we're looking for in these taxa to identify them on a Friday evening. Okay, so that concludes our presentations for the evening. Going to stop sharing my screen. Now, I just want to, you know, that was a lot of <laughs> information that we just went over. Um, so some of you may just wanna, you know, hit the sack and, and call it a night. But if there are any questions at this point, please feel free to write them in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself to ask um, either me or Debbie or Clea any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. That is very good. I do have a question. It is um, from um, not your presentation, but earlier uh, about data collection. 
I saw that there was a two year gap between uh, the collection and the submission. Did I read that wrong? No, yeah, so that, I, that was from Debbie's presentation yes. from DEP. Debbie, I don't know if you wanna take it, but um, you know, it's government, so it takes some time to sort of process um, the data and to, and to put these reports together. I mean, basically what the integrated report is, is it's a comprehensive review of water quality within the state. And so, you know, we've got, you know, 20 some thousand miles of streams and rivers in the state. It's a lot of data to go through. Um, so when uh, we do the integrated report, we, we will um, produce that report every two years. Mm -hmm. And each report, Debbie, correct me if I'm wrong, uses, I think, the last five years of data. So um, something like the 2016 report, it uses data from 2014 back to 2009, I believe. Um, so they kind of have that two year gap between 2014 and 2016 in order to produce this report. But, but they're kind of doing this over and over and over every two years. But don't things change quickly? I mean, does it? Sure. So to me, it's like, you know, things can change in a couple of weeks or months. So if there's a report that's being generated and it's, you know, that old, um, yeah, you're always trying to do catch up, right? Absolutely. So I think, I think that's a really great point in where um, community water monitoring groups can really fill that gap. So this integrated report, it is targeted towards action, for the regulatory action that will go to improve the stream. So if you have a really high quality stream, you mm -hmm. wanna put extra protections on the riparian buffers, make these buffers wider so we can protect the integrity of our great streams. And then on the other side of the equation for, for streams that we're finding to be really polluted in these integrated reports, we can kind of create a, as Debbie mentioned, the sort of diet of pollutants. We can kind of limit permit loadings of um, nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever the pollutant of concern is. And that's a very long-term sort of solution to these issues. But something else that Debbie mentioned uh, was something like the find it and fix it um, mm -hmm. kind of methodology that is used by Clean Ocean Action. So that, that is something that, you know, that data is not going into that integrated report, but we're using that data to identify problems and to fix them right away um, without like playing the blame game kind of thing. And so there's, you know, monitoring data can be used in a ton of different capacities. The integrated report is just one way that we use that data. And yeah, admittedly, there is a sort of a gap in time there. Um, but for the most part, mm -hmm. uh, biological conditions in streams can be pretty stable over time. Um, but of course, with the with the raw way monitoring program, I believe you'll get out um, annually or twice a year, I believe. So you can definitely take a closer look at those temporal changes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Bianca. I, I'll just jump in oh, and sorry, take a very good question and Aaron yeah. answered it very well, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Bianca, uh, your hand is raised. Yeah, so my question, uh, my question is around the, the, the size of a site a sampling site, because you were saying, right, there's different um, stream, was it stream uh, qualities, right? The, uh, the, the riffles and the sediment, uh, those four. So yeah. I, obviously if I walk, uh, I don't know, 200 yards down the stream, I might find them, find them all. Is it like limited to, uh, I don't know, 10 by 10 or like what makes a site or do I go so far that I find all uh, so? <laughs> right. That would be a lot to ask, I think. No, that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, we tend to look at stream segments of 100 meter stretches, which is about what, 328 feet or so. So we do limit it to a specific range. Now, in some cases, there could be a log down the center where you're not able to access, you know, the upstream or downstream portion of your stream rate. And there is a section on your data sheet to indicate the actual size of the reach you were able to collect that data from, um, but we are targeting 100 meters. Yeah, good question. 
Right. Okay. So in the in the chat box, we have a few questions. Can we use gloves to hold these lovely critters? Yes. Yes, of course. You can definitely um, use gloves to hold all of these guys. Some people have, you know, pretty severe fears of insects. And I, I think I was probably one of those people before I got into the macroinvertebrate business. Um, but you'll find that a lot of these organisms, once you get to know them, they're just, they're just walking on your hand and they're just lovely little guys. And we're just kind of introducing ourselves into their lives for a little moment, pull them out of their habitat to count them, and then we put them right back in the stream. Um, so, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, they're shredders, they will eat bits of leaves, um, but there are some predators that do have, you know, larger mouth parts, something like the helgramite or Dobson fly larva, that's another word for it. It does have pretty big chompers up front um, or the crayfish, you know, we have the claws. So in those two specific instances, I would say to use a little bit more caution when, when picking them up. If you see big old mouth parts, you don't want to stick your finger in that mouth. Um, it will pinch and it will hurt, but it, you know, just a little pinch. <laughs> but we're going to try not to get pinched. So the next question here, do we need any special gear for Sunday? Great question again. I am not sure if we have rainfall in the forecast. The last time I checked, there may have been like a 30% chance. So special gear, I would say is a raincoat <laughs> if, if we do need it, something with a hood, um, because we will do this rain or shine um, as long as it's not thundering and lightning or really, really pouring probably. Well, we wouldn't wanna be out there. Um, but if it's sprinkling, we, we will continue to uh, do our work out there. Other special gear, I do have uh, a, you know, a supply of waders, but for the size of this group, you know, I don't think that I'll have enough waders to go around. Um, also, the waders are sized based on your shoe size. So, um, you know, I may have a size five and maybe you're a size 12. And so we have to also kind of match up um, the size to the individuals wearing them. So I think what I will do is in the survey I send out tomorrow, I'll ask your shoe size and kind of get an idea of how many people will, will want to request waiters. And uh, we'll go from there. So hopefully uh, we'll have waiters for everyone who needs them. If it's warm enough, and I think it will be, um, you can also go into the stream wearing shorts and um, like stream shoes like Tevas or Keens or something, but it has to have a covered toe. So when we're kicking down into the sediment, you know, you don't want to have bare toes, that, that would be a mess. That would not be good. Um, also, maybe um, knee boots. If you have knee boots, um, that would be a great thing to bring. And that was a question. Yeah, so will knee high boots be sufficient? Now, when I looked at the stream last week, I think that would be sufficient, especially around the edges. Uh, but the, the stream flow can really change depending on recent rainfall. So, um, you know, we can't make any guarantees as to, as to the height of the water on Sunday. Um, but I think we can bring knee boots and be hopeful. <laughs> Do you provide gloves? Um, you know, we don't really have a great supply of gloves, but we may have um, like gloves that will go up to the elbow, sort of like kitchen gloves. And so I'll bring, I'll bring some of those and, and anyone who wants to use those can definitely pop those on. Alrighty, do we need insect or tick repellent? In this area, it, it does not seem to be very buggy. I didn't, I didn't have any issues when I was there. Um, if you have a stream site, you know, in future that is sort of boggy and kind of like in this shady wooded area, that, that, you know, could be a different story depending on the site. But this particular one, I think, um, is pretty bug free. Well, not bug free. We're looking for bugs. We want the bugs, but you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. So I don't think there are any other, oh, will you supply a next? Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I will bring um, a ton, every net I can find to uh, um, have be able to share amongst the group. Um, I will have the trays. I will have, um, we, we will use like little paint brushes and um, forceps and, and just plastic spoons to sort of manipulate the organisms and move them into ice, ice cube trays. Um, and so, yeah, I will bring all of that stuff, our decontamination materials, I'll bring all of that good stuff. And then in the future, when you actually go to do your monitoring, then you would coordinate with CLIA, um, with Rahway River Watershed Association to, um, you know, pick up your supplies, go do your monitoring, and then like drop them back off um, to Rahway. Okay. Well, if that is all, we can go ahead and conclude for the night. So I hope we didn't scare you away. And I hope that we will see you uh, tomorrow evening at 6.30 again. And you can use the same uh, Zoom link for that. All right. Thank you so much and have a great night, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.